Um, well, thanks, Olivia. And um, it is uh, a real honor to have the last lecture of the course. Um, I, I'm also aware that for those in the UK, at least, I'm the last lecture that stands between you and your lunch. So I will try not to um, go on for too long. Um, I thought this would be a really nice opportunity just to wrap up everything we've uh, seen in the course so far in terms of functional MRI um, and just walk you through the steps of performing a DCM analysis um, and kind of going from the very beginning to, to, to the very end. Um, I, I, I want to pick up on a few themes that you've heard today and on previous days. Uh, something that Edda talked about that's really important is this concept of an inverse problem. And I think this is nice just to revisit because it um, kind of summarizes what we've been trying to achieve today with all this stuff about modeling and Bayesian statistics. So inverse problems are really common in science and in engineering. Uh, an example I like to use as an analogy is the, is the, is the example of, of seismology and geology. So let's say you were interested in what's going on at the center of the earth. Um, you clearly cannot measure that directly. Um, but what you could do potentially is specify a model that says if the core of the earth was arranged in a particular way, these are the measurements I'd expect to measure at the Earth's surface. And if you've got that forward model, also called a generative model, that could generate the data you'd expect to measure, given your hypothesis, you can then run that model in reverse. And it's Bayesian statistics that helps you with that model inversion. It's exactly the same in neuroimaging. We're interested in what's going on at the level of neuro neural populations. We can't directly measure those non-invasively in humans, but what we can do are measure data features like FNIRs, fMRI, EEG, MEG. We can specify models that say, if the brain was wired up in this way, what would we expect to measure? And then we can run those models in reverse and ask, given the data, what's the most probable set of connection strengths, for example. And that's what today has been all about, these difficult model inversion problems. Um, it's also just worth taking a step back and asking, what's the point of science? Not wishing to get too lofty with this lecture, but you could say that the point of science is to try and ask, given I've got some hypotheses, some ideas about how my data were generated, I want to be able to test which hypothesis, or speaking more formally, which model, offers the best explanation for my data. And what you've heard about today is all about Bayesian statistics, and that all centers around a quantity that is really, really important. And that quantity is the model evidence. It's the probability that I would have seen my data given my model, model number one in this example, M1. Once I've got that, so once I've got the software to estimate for me the model evidence, also called the marginal likelihood, what do I do with that number? Well, in itself, it's not that meaningful. It only becomes meaningful once I've got at least one other model. So let's say I've got two models now, model one and model two. I've got the software, the statistical package to generate for me the probability of the data under each model. I can then take the ratio of those evidences. That evidence is called the Bayes factor. And that's the really critical quantity for us. So if the Bayes factor is a big positive number, it means model one was much better than model two. And if it's a very small positive number, it means that model two was better. So all of this machinery that we've been talking about today, DCM, Bayesian analysis, it's trying to get us to this result, to this Bayes factor for the evidence of one model with respect to another. And that then generalizes. So you can have as many models as you want, and you can compute the evidence for every model relative to some control model. And what you've heard about today with DCM is the specific application of Bayesian model comparison to models of um, brain connectivity. And let's say I have two different models of connectivity. Within the software, there's a different equation for each one. Practically, you don't specify the equations, you just tick boxes in the software, and it will compute the evidence for each model and then give you a Bayes factor as a result. So that's the overarching like end goal of where we want to get with our analyses. So I'm going to suggest then to get to that step, there are eight steps in total for uh, DCM for fMRI, and I just want to walk through them. The first step is to write down some hypotheses. Then we're going to design an fMRI experiment. Then we'll collect some data 
and pre-process the data so it's in the right format for analysis. Then we want to work out where in the brain stuff was happening, and that's called functional localization. We then perform the DCM analysis to investigate the connectivity within each subject um, between those sources that we've localized. Now we can move to the group level, and I'll introduce in this talk um, the technology we use for group analysis. It's called Parametric Empirical Bayes, or PEP. Um, then we do the final really important result I just mentioned, Bayesian model comparison, asking which model best explains the group level data. And finally, optionally, we could do um, we could assess predictive validity. Predictive validity means, given my model, could I predict some new data that I've not yet observed? In other words, um, to give an example, could I predict if I've got a patient versus control study, could I predict whether a new subject coming along has the disease or does not have a disease or has particular scores on a cognitive test, for example, using my DCM. Um, then number nine, you write the paper and number 10, you collect your Nobel Prize. Um, and there may be a small temp gap of a few years between stages nine and 10. Okay, so let me now work through those 10 steps and we'll go into a bit of detail. And a lot of this will be recapping things that you've seen on the course. So number one, write down some hypotheses, and I can't emphasize this enough. DCM is a tool for scoring the evidence for different hypotheses. It's not an exploratory technique. So before you've got started, you really need to be thinking, what, are, what am I using this tool for? What are the different hypotheses I want to distinguish between? And those hypotheses tend to take one of two different forms. One form is about the commonalities of what's, what's typical across the population. So for example, you might state, I hypothesize that top-down connections from parietal cortex are modulated by paying attention to some visual stimuli. The other kind of hypothesis is about what's different between people. So a difference hypothesis um, would look something like this. I, I hypothesize that people with a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment have weaker modulation of their top-down connections by attention. So two examples of really specific hypotheses that you could then formalize by specifying them as mathematical models. And remember, a model is just a formal way of writing down a hypothesis about how the data were generated. DCM provides the tools then to distinguish the evidence for these different models. Um, typically in DCM, we take the approach that one hypothesis becomes one model. So in this example on the left, um, you've got four different hypotheses. We've got a, a network of four brain regions. And in this first hypothesis, we might say that maybe my experimental task like um, paying attention or um, naming some visual stimuli that I see in front of me modulates the, the self connections on these uh, top two regions here. Second hypothesis is that it's the bottom two regions, third the left and the fourth is the right. So in this case, one hypothesis becomes one model, four models, and we assess the evidence for each one. The other alternative that you'll often see in DCM studies is that one hypothesis becomes a family of models, also called a group of models. So here we have two families. In the left-hand family, family one, we've got those four models I just, kind of four models similar to that I just showed you, so that maybe it's the self-connections that are modulated by the task. And in each model, we've got a different self-connection that is modulated. Second family of models, it's the between region connections that are modulated. So uh, kind of biologically speaking, the first family here hypothesizes that um, it's local changes within a brain region. You can think of that as like the excitatory in inhibitory balance in each region is modulated by my task. And the second hypothesis is that it's about between region connectivity. So each hypothesis now becomes one family of models and a family contains many models. And then you would get the overall evidence for each family. Ultimately then 
the question may arise in your head is how many models is reasonable or how many families of models are reasonable? How many hypotheses should I come up with? And really, it's a psychological question. It really depends on the working memory capacity of the person reading your paper. So I'm sure somebody reading your paper can hold in their working memory two, three, four, maybe as many as eight different hypotheses. But when you get further than that, when you've got, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 hypotheses, your reader is going to get totally lost. So really the limit on the number of models or on the number of families of models depends on how many, basically the story you can tell in your paper. And I'd say definitely have no more than no more than eight models or eight families of models. Uh, otherwise, your reader is just going to get really, really confused. The last thing on writing down hypotheses, it's a really good idea just to draw them out in diagram form. And I do this whenever I do a DCM analysis, um, just literally pen and paper, um, because it forces you to be really clear and explicit about what you think the connections are going to be in your different hypotheses. Um, this is from a real study that um, I did a few years ago. Um, and then when you've got the results out of DCM, you can write them on and it kind of makes more sense. Okay, so that's hypotheses, really important. Number two, now you've got some hypotheses, you're gonna design your experiment. And we had a brilliant lecture yesterday on experimental design. Um, and then a, a lecture after that on um, from Christian on event related designs and trying to optimize those for fMRI. All of those same principles apply when you're doing a DCM analysis. One take home message I'd like you to retain from those is the important those lectures is the importance of a factorial design and factorial designs are really statistically efficient and they they translate directly into DCM analysis. So let me just give you an example. Let's say we've got a two by two factorial design um, looking at face processing. And the first factor is whether faces are displayed the right way up or they're displayed upside down. Second factor is whether the participant was cued to either attend to the emotion of the faces, that's the thing we're interested in, or to attend to an uninteresting feature, the hair color. Now that's a really well-designed experiment why? Well, you heard from um, uh, the event-related design lecture yesterday that it's important to have baseline conditions that are well-matched. So faces versus upside-down faces, we know uh, evokes a change in fusiform face area, for example. And then we've got the second manipulation where the subject always has to pay attention to something, but sometimes it's the thing we're interested in, emotion, and sometimes it's the uninteresting thing, which is hair color. That translates directly into the design of the DCM. So let's say I designed a DCM with two brain regions, primary visual cortex and the fusiform face area. We could use one of those factors as the driving input. So let's say we decide that is the presentation of faces. So here we've got a ping coming into the system every time there's a face. That's the C matrix in the neural model that Edda introduced. And the second factor, let's say is the emotion factor. And now we're going to say that any time there was uh, an inst instruction to the subject to pay attention to emotion, we're going to have a block regressor here that up or down regulates the strength of a particular connection. So that's really statistically efficient because we're leveraging the two different factors to form two set separate um, sets of parameters in the model the B parameters, which are modulators, and the C parameters, which are driving inputs. So factorial designs, really efficient. They also let you test for interactions, um, which is uh, a good thing. Another thing I'll, I'll say about experimental design, and I'm going to make a reasonably um, controversial statement now, um, uh, maybe a provocative statement, which is wherever possible, I would recommend you favor having a controlled task over the use of resting state. So you'll be aware that resting state experiments, the subject is just instructed to, uh, to relax, um, but remain awake whilst in the scanner. A controlled task is where you as the experimenter is selecting when to present stimuli of different types. Now resting state has a lot of really good uses in specific cases. 
For example, resting state is really useful when you have participants that can't perform a task. For example, if, they're, um, if they have a particular medical condition, maybe you have subjects with dementia, for example, or children who would find it hard to concentrate. Resting state can be really useful. Resting state is also really important, vital, if you want to understand resting state brain dynamics, if you actually want to know what happens when the brain is at rest. Great time to use resting state. And there may be many other situations um, which I haven't thought of, and maybe in, put in the chat for those watching live, put in the chat if you can think of other really good uses for resting state. But the reason I say try and avoid it and use a task where possible is because resting state analysis makes life much harder for yourself as a modeler, because you don't know when the driving inputs occurred that stimulated the brain. You are electing not to have experimental control. You're giving that up. And that just makes things a little bit harder from an analysis perspective. If, however, you do want to use resting state, there is a DCM for that, and it's called DCM for cross spectral densities or spectral DCM. And I'm just going to spend a moment talking about it. Um, now, in this case, factorial designs are still a really good idea. Um, but now the factorial design is typically at the between subjects level. So you will have perhaps, just to give an example of a two by two design, you know, have two groups of participants, maybe patients and controls. That would be one factor. And the other factor might be pre and post an intervention, for example, the administration of a drug or after some time has elapsed, maybe some training. So that's where your two by two now lives. It now lives at the between subjects level uh, rather than at the within subject level. I'll just say a bit, get, get, give you an example of a really nice application of spectral DCM for resting state. Um, and this is uh, a study conducted by my colleague, uh, George Thomas, who recently completed his PhD. So he was interested in visual hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. And he asked the very specific question. So this is an example of having a really specific hypothesis. Are visual hallucinations in Parkinson's disease explained by impaired bottom-up integration of sensory information and or overweighting of top-down perceptual priors within the visual system. So there's some technical language there, but essentially this boils down to, is it the connections ascending the visual hierarchy that are different in people with Parkinson's disease who experience hallucinations, or is it the top-down connectivity from higher brain regions? Really clearly stated hypotheses, which makes it suitable for DCM analysis. He had 15, um, um, Parkinson's patients with hallucinations and 17 Parkinson's 75 with without hallucinations. So a nice sample size. He got them to go in the scanner, undergo resting state fMRI, and then he analyzed their data using DCM. I talked earlier about the idea of having families of models. And this is an example of a family-wise model space um, or a factorial model space is another phrase. So in the first types, three types of model, the connections in the model were either top down from higher to lower regions, or they were bottom up, or they were both. In the second family of kind of factor of models, um, the connections were either interhemispheric or intrahemispheric. So they stayed within a hemisphere or went between hemispheres. And the third factor was which brain regions in the network were involved, for example, just uh, hippocampus or hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. These were called factors because he specified all possible mixtures of these three different uh, factors. So for example, there was one model he considered that only had bottom-up connections that were only intrahemispheric and only pertained to the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. So he had all possible mixtures of these different kinds of model and then could do family-wise model comparison. So here's what he found, just to show you um, an example. So at the top here, we've got an example from one subject. This is a within subject. Here are the brain regions he included. And this is nice just to show you the form of the resting state data. So what you're trying to predict. This is called this cross spectral density. And it tells you for every frequency, for every oscillatory frequency, how much power you have at different frequencies. 
So this is frequency versus power or amplitude. So in normal DCM for fMRI, we're trying to directly find a model that can fit the time series. Whereas in spectral DCM, we're trying to fit the Fourier transform of the time series. In other words, the frequency domain. What that, uh, and I'm just gonna just spend 30 seconds telling you why that's uh, useful and important. Um, if Fourier analysis is outside of your experience, please don't worry. Um, I'm gonna move on from it in just a moment. Um, the cross spectral density is the frequency equivalent of something called the cross correlation function in the time domain. It tells the cross correlation is how correlated are any two parts of the brain at different temporal lags. So the instantaneous correlation, the correlation when you allow a one second lag between regions, the correlation when you allow a two second lag between regions, etc. So the full set of lags gives you the cross correlation. And this is the Fourier transform of that. When you do re uh, resting state functional connectivity analysis, you might have heard that phrase, that's only looking at the instantaneous correlation of different brain regions, how correlated a two time series without considering any lags. So what that means is that functional connectivity is a special case of what DCM looks at. DCM is trying to fit a much richer characterization of the data that encompasses all the different possible lags between the regions. And the question DCM is asking is what connection strengths would best explain that, uh, that cross correlation at different lags, essentially. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, um, I recommend George's paper. It's really clearly written. Um, and I'm sorry, I haven't got more time to explain the theory right now. Let me show you what the outputs of doing this analysis look like. You get an estimated set of connection strengths. And what you can then do is take those connection strengths and correlate them with some clinical or behavioral measure. So here, George correlated the connection strengths with the severity of hallucinations that the patients were experiencing and showed that there were specific connections that correlated really nicely. And I think that's another point to make about DCM analysis. You've obviously got this all this mathematical modeling, which is really technical. You've got all these layers of um, mathematics between you and the data. I think it's really reassuring and really nice to show that the parameters you get out of this, the connection strengths, correlate with something meaningful in the real world. And in this case, it's something meaningful in terms of a, a clinical score. So that's just an example of resting state. But actually, I introduced this to show that Although this is really useful for certain groups here, Parkinson's disease patients, if you can do a task, do a task. Okay, so that was experimental design. Data collection and pre-processing. Um, so we've, we've, we've had our hypothesis session with our colleagues. We've sat down, we've written down our ideas, we've designed our experiment, we've collected our data. Now we need to um, pre-process that data. So just to emphasize for anyone who's missed it, where DCM fits in the pipeline. And DCM fits at the end of the pipeline here. So we've done our MRI acquisition. We've done our pre-processing. We've done our SPM analysis, our general linear model. We're gonna extract time series from regions of interest and then do DCM on those time series to explain why they interact. Um, no special consideration. So the, the, the pre-processing and the data collection are exactly the same, whether you're doing just an SPM analysis or doing a DCM analysis, all the same principles apply. Okay, that was quick. That was um, a quick one, number three. Functional localization. Okay, what's the point of, um, why do we do SPM before DCM? Let me explain. So a network, consists of two things. It consists of nodes uh, or brain regions in plain language and the connections between them. So before we can ask about the connections, we have to select the nodes, the brain regions. Now you've hopefully with your hypotheses before doing the experiment already got an idea of the brain regions you expect, but that may not quite correspond to what you actually find. And you also need to like Maybe you hypothesize prefrontal cortex, but you might have some different activations in prefrontal cortex, and you're going to have to choose one for your DCM analysis. 
So in a task-based experiment, the purpose of DCM is to infer the underlying neural connectivity that gave rise to your SPM results. So you did SPM, you got some colorful blobs on the brain. That looks really cool, really interesting, really beautiful. But now you wanna go deeper and ask, what was the connectivity that caused those SPM results? That's the point of DCM. Um, and so we have to select regions of interest using the contrast that we've specified in the GLM analysis. In resting state, things are a little bit different. We haven't got uh, an SPM analysis to begin with. So for resting state, the purpose of DCM is to infer the underlying neural connectivity that caused the functional connectivity. In other words, that caused the correlations or the cross-spectral density among pre-selected brain regions. I said pre-selected, you could also perform what's called an independent components analysis using an SPM toolbox um, to, to help you select those brain regions. Right, networks have two, point, two parts, nodes and connections. That was the nodes. Let's talk about the first level DCM analysis. So a first level DCM analysis has got two outputs, all right? So there's some theory here. I hope the theory isn't too complicated, but if you don't understand the theory, the key thing to understand is what the inputs and the outputs are. So let's talk about the outputs you get from a DCM analysis. One output, as Edda mentioned, is the free energy. This can get a bit technical if you're reading um, papers. Free energy is a concept that comes from statistical physics. That's why it's called an energy. If you are in the machine learning literature, in machine learning, it has a different name. It's called the evidence lower bound or elbow. It's exactly the same thing. The free energy is an approximation of the log of the model evidence, the probability of the data given the model. And it's the score that we use for quantifying the goodness of a model. Why is it so useful? Why not use some other score for the goodness of a model? So let me ask you, can you think of other scores that quantify how good a model is? You might have seen a few in the literature. One is simply the correlation coefficient. So if you've got a model that predicts some data, you could compute the correlation between the predicted data and the um, actual data. That's a good score, the correlation. If you've used statistical software like SPSS, you might have seen other scores like the BIC, which is the Bayesian Information Criterion, or the AIC. Um, how would you choose which of these different possible scores to use? The free energy has a really nice quality about it, um, which is that it can be decomposed into these two different components, the accuracy minus the complexity. The accuracy is how well the observed data matches the predicted data. Um, in technical terms, it's the expected log likelihood. And the complexity is how complicated your model was. Formally, that's quantified by the effective number of parameters in your model. And even more, to use technical language, it's the callback libel divergence. It's, the, it's a measure of distance between your priors and your posteriors. And so the free energy quantifies in just one number how well you balance accuracy minus complexity. And it has a number of advantages over other, um, over other measures. For example, the correlation coefficient only speaks about accuracy. It doesn't give you that trade-off between accuracy minus complexity. I can see there's a question in the chat. Um, in the GUI, why can't we see all the spectral density um, wave, bold or neural, in the results section? Um, we just see some of them. Um, so to be clear, the cross-spectral density that I mentioned a little bit earlier um, is the, for every frequency, it's the expression of uh, the power. Um, and it's that, that frequency plot is presented for every brain region separately. So in that sense, you see the full cross-spectral density across your, your different brain regions. Yeah, good question. So the free energy is our score for how good the model is. The other output that you're going to get are the estimated parameters. Now, it's worth just mentioning here, uh, do you remember I said, uh, said a bit earlier, it's, it's all about probabilities. 
Um, and you heard from Chris's lecture, it's all about Bayesian statistics. So in DCM, all the parameters are expressed in terms of multivariate Gaussian distributions or multivariate normal distributions. And let, just, just let me briefly talk about what that means and how, because it, it directly affects how you interpret your results. So let's say my model only had two parameters in it. One parameter could be the connection strength between one pair of regions, and the other parameter could be the connection strength between a different pair of regions. So I've got two parameters that I'm plotting here. What DCM will give you is the probability density over those two parameters, given this vertical bar means given the data and the model. Now you'll see that there are two kind of features in this uh, image. One is where this mountain is located, the mountain here being probability density. So that's the mean or the expected value of each parameter. So for example, this one here says that I expect after seeing the data that the parameter on this axis is about zero and the parameter on this axis is about, let's say, minus one, something like that. So the expected values are the connection strengths that you estimate. It's, it's where this mountain is positioned. The other feature you can see is the spread of this distribution in each axis, which tells you how uncertain you are, or reciprocally, how confident you are. The more peaky it is, the more confident you can be. That's the variance of each parameter. So DCM will give you both the expected value of each parameter and the variance or the uncertainty. It gives you something else as well. It gives you the rotation of this mountain in, the, in this space. And that's called the covariance or the correlation between parameters. So DCM gives you this, this very full representation, not only the connection strengths, but also how uncertain you, can, you should be and how correlated the parameters are with each other. In other words, how much does turning up one connection do the same thing to the data as maybe turning down another parameter? That's how you interpret the correlation. And that's the two outputs of a DCM for each individual subject. I'd say as well as getting those outputs, it's really important that you check the variance explained by your models. So I told you that the um, goodness of a model is accuracy minus complexity. This is accuracy. You can't use accuracy to compare different models, but you can use it as a sanity check to make sure that a non-trivial amount of variance is being explained. And you can take your DCM from each subject and put it into this function, SPM DCM from RICEC, and it will tell you the variance explained as a percentage. I think it's really important that you report that in your paper because you need to prove to the reader that you're explaining a, a non-trivial amount of variance. If you say, I've got this great new model of the visual system, but it only explains 3% of the variance, I think your reader could quite reasonably say, who cares? Um, so some good practice there. Right, so that was your first level DCM analysis. You've now estimated your DCM for every subject, which means for every subject, you've now got a free energy and, a, and the estimated connection strengths, both their expected values and the uncertainty and the covariance. So we can now do the second level analysis, that's group analysis. Um, and for this, we're gonna use an approach called parametric empirical Bayes. And let me just explain this in brief. Actually, it's really simple. Parametric and Bayes sounds really complicated just to, to preempt this. You know how in the GLM lectures, you saw you do a first level analysis of each subject's SPM, and now you do a second level analysis to look at group effects. This is exactly the same for DCM. You did your first level analysis, which are DCMs, and now you're gonna do a second level GLM analysis of your DCM connection strengths. So the kind of questions we want to address are as follows. Are the strength of particular connections changed by an experimental manipulation? Does belonging to a diagnostic group determine the strength of these connections? So your, your hypotheses might pertain to groups. Does the strength of connections correlate with behavioral or clinical variables? So you might have hypotheses that pertain to continuous variables, clinical scores. And could we predict a new participant's disease status 
with behavioral scores or behavioral scores using our estimates of the connections. These are the kind of um, questions you can ask using PEB. So what we do is as follows. The connectivity parameters from every individual subject are taken to the group level and modeled using a GLM, a general linear model. So let's write that out. Theta one is a vector containing the connection strengths from all your subjects. You can then specify a design matrix that which contains covariates. In other words, saying what you hypothesize is common or different between subjects, maybe your group differences or your continuous covariates. That is multiplied by um, now some second level parameters that we're going to estimate. So these parameters encode the effect of each covariate on each connection, and plus some unexplained between subject variability. And you may have heard the phrase random effects analysis. These are the random effects. These are the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the differences between people that are not due to our hypotheses. Um, and here's just an example design matrix to illustrate what I've just said. Let's imagine there's only one connection in each subject that we're taking up to the group level because it makes the plot here simpler. So we've got the six subjects, one connection from each of the six subjects is equal to this design matrix times by the parameters. The first column in the design matrix is just a, a constant, an intercept, and um, that's going to represent the group average connectivity. The second is a group difference. So this is minus ones and plus ones. This encodes the hypothesis that there are two groups who differ in their connection strength. And this is a continuous regressor, something like age or clinical score. And you'll get three parameters out of this, which encodes each of these three covariates effect on the connection. And as I said before, if you have multiple connections from each subject, then uh, I didn't say this before, but I'll say it now, um, then this, these three regressors will be replicated for every connection. So you'll end up with the effect, for example, of age on every connection, the effect of group on every connection and the group average of each connection. Um, the other thing you'll get, which is really useful, is you'll get the free energy for the entire group level model. So remember, free energy is a score for the goodness of the model. It's accuracy minus complexity, and it's just a single number. But now you're going to get the free energy for the entire group level uh, model, consisting of DCMs at the within subject level and a general linear model at the group level. The other output you'll get are the parameters at the group level, so the effect of each covariate on each connection. Now, you might be thinking, why can't I just take my connection strengths from every subject and put them in another software package like SPSS and do an ANOVA? Um, and the answer is you can. That's entirely reasonable. The difference between doing that and what I'm showing you here is that this is a fully Bayesian approach, which means that what's taken from the single subject to the group level is not just the connection strengths, but also the estimated uncertainty. So I showed you that mountain and it's got a certain amount of spread, which represents our uncertainty. That also goes from the individual subjects up to the group level when you form this GLM, meaning that subjects who are more, uh, who you can be more confident about for a particular connection will contribute more to this group result than subjects you could be less confident about. And that's really nice. It means you're not throwing away that confidence information that you got from your DCM analysis, whereas you would be throwing those confidences away if you just used um, a frequentist or classical GLM in, in SPSS or MATLAB or, or another package. Um, so that's group analysis. It just extends um, dynamic causal modeling from being a sub single subject level to a, an, a model of an entire group. This phrase here, parametric empirical Bayes, you'll see that in the literature. It's just a fancy way of saying um, a hierarchical model where you're, trend, where you're sending from each level in the model, um, not only the parameters, but actually a full probability distribution over the parameters, which includes uncertainty. I can see there's some questions in the chat. I'm gonna come back to those at the end, um, but please, um, please do keep them coming. Um, and uh, do submit them now if uh, uh, if there's any chance you might forget them.
Okay, so we've gone through a lot of stages and um, you're still with, with me. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. So um, we've gone through uh, almost all the analysis now. We've done the modeling. We've done the within subject modeling. We've gone to the group level. We've now estimated our group level effects. So we've got a, a, a GLM now containing the effect of each covariate on each connection. We can now do the most important thing, which is Bayesian model comparison. So what we can do is compare that GLM against alternative GLMs where we've switched on and off various covariates. Let me give you an example. Let's say one hypothesis is that there is an effective age on, the connection, on a particular connection strength in these subjects. So my GLM that I use in my PEB model looks like this, the constant, the group difference, and the effective age. So that's my first PEP model. My alternative model is one where I just have removed that age effect, I've switched it off. So I've expressed two different hypotheses here. There is an effect of age and there isn't an effect of age. So which is the better model of my connection strengths? Oh, and, and then in turn, a model of my fMRI data. Now, of course, there's two different factors here. There's accuracy and there's complexity. There's accuracy, so which of these is the more accurate model? Does adding age maybe make my model more accurate? But then there's complexity, right? Because I've had to add in an extra covariate, which means I've um, made my model more complex. I've used up a degree of freedom. So which is the better model once we trade off accuracy and complexity? Well, I've already told you that to find that out, we're gonna need to compute the free energy for each one and compare them. So I get the free energy for each model. That's just a single number. And then um, we take those two free energies and we compute uh, the log base factor. So remember the, lo the log of a base factor is the difference in the free energies. Maybe I'll just briefly explain that in case uh, anyone's forgotten it. I think um, Chris mentioned it and, and Ed too. Um, the base factor is the ratio of evidences. It's the probability of the data given model one divided by the probability of the data given model two. So it's the ratio. When you're working with logs, ratios or divisions become subtraction. So because the free energy is approximately the log evidence, it becomes a subtraction. So the log base factor is the free energy of one model minus another. It's really, really simple. Like the software will just give you a free energy for each model and you just subtract them. And that gives you this statistic called the log base factor. If that log base factor is large, it means there's a large and positive. It means there's a um, strong evidence in favor of this model with the age covariate. And if it's large and negative, it means there's strong evidence for the null with no covariate. And that's, again, a really important point to make about the difference between Bayesian and frequentist statistics. With Bayesian statistics, we can find evidence for the null, which you couldn't do with frequentist statistics. And that might be useful for some of your studies. So there may be studies where you can, um, you particularly want to show there is no effect. And you can do that with DCM because we're using um, Bayesian methods. Okay. Now, um, I'm gonna just gonna mention a technical detail. I've simplified things a little bit here by showing you a model with and without um, the age covariate. And the idea is we'd estimate the evidence for each one. And in other words, estimate the free energy and then compare them. Turns out there's actually a really useful analytical technique that means you only have to specify one model and it can work out behind the scenes for you, what would the free energy be if you switched off some of these parameters? If you switched off different covariates, for example, or different connections. And that's called Bayesian model reduction. And I'm just gonna spend a moment talking about it um, because you'll probably come across it in quite a lot of DCM papers. There's a couple of ways you can deploy it. One way is that you specify your different models according to your hypotheses. So here we've got three different hypotheses. One is that these six brain regions are really highly connected. Another one is that they kind of have this kind of form. So connections are mediated by these uh, linkages in four and five. And here's, here's a third hypothesis. 
we can estimate the evidence for just the full model. So full model means that um, it's got all the parameters that are interesting to us. It doesn't necessarily have all the, all the possible connections, just all the ones that are interesting. We estimate the evidence for this model, which the software will do uh, in about, I don't know, it takes a, 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 at least a minute, maybe a few minutes to compute the evidence. And then it'll apply this analytic technique called Bose in model reduction to infer what the evidence or free energy would be for these alternative models under the constraint that these have to be nested. So they have to just have some connections switched off. And it can infer the free energy for these two models almost instantaneously. It takes a few milliseconds. So by just fitting one model to the data, you can then, and running Bayesian model reduction, you can generate a, a bar chart that shows you the free energy for the three models. And then it's quite easy to convert that through um, a kind of winner takes all approach to give you the posterior probability for each model. So that's just, just normalizing this plot between zero and one. And it's this plot you can show to the reader because it, they don't need any expertise in Bayesian methods. You know, just all these numbers are between zero and one. So there's really clear evidence that model two was the best. So that's one way of using Bayesian model reduction. And of course, because this can run in milliseconds, you could have very, very large numbers of models and it barely takes any time at all. The alternative you can do is you can do an automatic search. So let's say you had, you started with a full model where you think that all the connections a priori are biologically reasonable, and that's important. You're only including connections that a priori you think are reasonable. What you can now do is ask the software to automatically try switching on and off thousands of different uh, mixtures of these connections scoring their free energy, and then reporting which one has the best free energy. And that's what's shown here. So we started with some parameters. This is parameters versus um, the connection strength that we use to generate the data. The software, when you fit the full model, model one, will give you the strength of those connections. Then you run this automatic search procedure, which can analyze thousands of models per second, and then you get just the reduced parameters that survived that comparison. So these are the ones that maximize the free energy. A constraint on this approach, a limitation, is I'd recommend only doing it for linear models because there are certain assumptions that it makes. And an example of a linear model is the GLM I showed you here. So group level DCM analysis, where your analysis is based on these GLMs. Um, this will work very, very well indeed. I would recommend against using it at the single subject level where the model is nonlinear. Um, but this is a real time saver and it means you can do this kind of cool kind of what you might have heard in machine learning as structure learning, trying thousands of different models and assessing their evidence. So that's Bayesian model reduction. Okay, we've gone through all of the data analysis steps now for hypothesis testing. Final, final thing. Um, is uh, is predictive validity. So let's say you read that somebody's made a model and it can explain 90% of the variance on, in the fMRI data. And it shows that some connections were involved and some connections were not. So what? Like, I think it's a reasonable question, particularly for a clinical study. So the object where the objective is not just cognitive neuroscience, but it's now asking, do particular connections have some clinical relevance? I think it's reasonable to ask, do your connection strengths predict something or relate to something in the real world? And that's step number eight. So here's a kind of question we might ask. Are the effect sizes that I detected large enough to predict the group membership or clinical scores of new participants who, I have, who were not exposed to the training of the model before? And for this, we use something called cross-validation. So let me just be clear on these two different agendas. One is a scientific agenda to ask which hypothesis best explains the data. The best way to do that is by using Bayesian model comparison. And you can prove that comparing models based on the evidence 
is the most powerful test you can do using a, a generalization of a, of a mathematical proof called the Nyman Pearson lemma. There is no more sensitive approach for working out what's the best hypothesis than Bayesian model comparison. This, what we're moving on to now, is a separate agenda. It's asking, I've worked out what my best model is, I've got some parameters, but are those parameters useful? Could they predict something new? And that's a separate question. Um, and it's one that we use cross-validation for. So here's what the output of the software looks like when you ask a question like this. And we'll do uh, one of these analyses if you select to do the DCM workshop. And if not, you can find the instructions on the SPM website. Um, what you'll get is a plot like this. Here's the group membership that went into the general linear model, the PEB model. So I've got some subjects in group zero and some in group one. And then here is a particular parameter that we've estimated. And you can see that that parameter um, is very clearly separating these two groups. They're very clearly linearly separable with the exception of one subject here who was uh, probably misclassified, an outlier. And the software will tell you the correlation between the known group effect and the estimated parameter. That's what's called the out of samples correlation. So what this is doing is it's training the PEB model on all but one subject, leaving out one subject, predicting their group membership based on your DCM, and then um, testing how accurate that was, put that subject back in, and now repeat the process um, for the next subject, et cetera, et cetera, and then averaging that performance across all the subjects. That's called leave one out cross-validation. I think it's really nice to do this if you can, if you have a between subjects effect, in order to demonstrate um, that um, your parameters have some real world meaning. Um, and I don't think I talk about it here, um, but there is a very nice uh, mathematical result that shows there is a formal relationship between which model wins if you do a Bayesian model comparison and which model has the highest cross-validation accuracy, predictive accuracy. Turns out if you select the model with the highest um, free energy, log evidence, you're naturally selecting for the one with the best predictive accuracy. Um, and that's because it's going to be the model that generalizes the best. So there is a formal link actually between the two kinds of analysis. So that was a lot. Um, you can now collect your Nobel Prize, um, having successfully gone to the end of the, of the pipeline. We wrote down hypotheses and we emphasized that this was a hypothesis um, driven technique. We designed an experiment, we did our pre-processing, localized our sources with our SPM, did our first and second level DCM analysis, compared models to get the scientific result of what's the best explanation for the data, and then we assessed predictive validity. Okay, now, <laughs> right, it's, I, I, this is the last lecture of the course. You've been listening to me speak a long time. I don't want to go on too long. I might just spend the last, say, five, six minutes just giving a, a, a published example so you can just see how these steps go in practice. And then I've finished. This was a study conducted by my colleague, master student, um, uh, Claire Tack. And uh, it's a really nice piece of work looking at the aging brain. And this was looking at why is it that you get this weird phenomenon that if you move your right hand, the motor cortex, sensory motor cortex in the right hemisphere of your brain has a negative bold response. It's upside down. But as you get older, that negative bold response gets smaller and smaller until when you're old, uh, very old, then it's going to even go positive. And the question is, why does that happen? What were the connections that could explain that phenomenon that we see in the SPM results? So there was this very clear effect of age that we determined with the SPM analysis, 635 participants aged 18 to 88. And we found you could cluster those subjects according to the amplitude of their bold response in right sensory motor cortex. So here's age versus bold response. Older subjects who are in red had this more positive bold response and younger subjects had this um, negative bold response. In blue, the question was why? 
So we fitted a DCM for fMRI. Here's the full forward model that's used in DCM. The neural, you've got, a, as Edda described, there is a model of the neural connectivity with parameters A, B, and C that Edda spoke about. A is the um, average connectivity across conditions. B is the modulations. C is the driving input. And we estimate those from the data. That neural model drives a model of, of blood flow that describes how neural activity via vasodilation causes a blood flow, which causes a change in blood volume and deoxyhemoglobin, and that causes the bold signal. All of this model is under the hood. You don't need to configure this in any way. It just works out of the box. So it describes how a connection architecture gives rise to observed bold signals. We fitted that model to the data, and here was our full model. It had this format, six brain regions, mo mo supplementary motor area, premotor cortex, primary motor cortex. And the key thing, do you remember I said, it's really important to look at your explained variants. Or in this case, you wanted to check that the model could actually predict the data feature we were interested in. So the data feature we were interested in was the negativity of the bold response. So what we wanted to check is when we fitted this model to the data, did you actually see these negative bold responses in young people that you didn't see in old people? And that's what you're seeing here on the right. So this is what the model predicts that a young person would show and an old person would show, older person would show. So that confirmed that the model was working as intended. It's always really important to check that. Okay, so that was our first level DCM analysis fitting this model to every subject, and then checking that the predicted data looked good. Here's the estimated parameters. So maybe I, I actually didn't say this before, and I should have done. Once you've done your Bayesian model comparison, and you found what's the best model for your data, you then actually want to look inside it and see what the parameters were. What were the estimated connection strengths? Which ones were positive? Which ones were negative? Which ones were strong? Which ones were weak? So this is what you're seeing here. The average connection strengths as estimated using PEB for the older subjects and the younger subjects. So in the older subjects, what you can see is that there is a strong positive connection from the left hemisphere motor regions, premotor regions, to right M1, that's primary motor cortex, and a negative connection from left to right. So you can interpret positive and negative connections as excitation and inhibition. In the younger subjects, what you see is that um, this connection was flipped, and this one was much less positive. So as you get older from the connection strengths, it seems like these connections become more positive in their effect. I should also emphasize that this is not interpretable in terms of monosynaptic connections. It's not necessarily the case that this is one axon. There may be multiple synapses between these two regions. All this is saying is that the overall effect of the SMA on M1 is positive, is excitatory. The really nice thing about having a model like this is that you can not only report what are the connection strengths in your two groups, but you can then use your model to do some in silico experiments. So what I asked, um, what um, we asked the question here was if you turn up this left premotor dorsal connection, you see it's negative in young people, positive in older people. If we turn it up like a dial, what happens to the predicted bold response in right M1? And this is what's shown here. It goes from being negative through to being positive. So that shows that not only is this connection different between groups, but it's also the case that this is a sufficient explanation, this interhemispheric switch in influence is a sufficient explanation for why we see that change in the bold response. And I just think that's another selling point for having models is that you can do these kind of experiments. You can imagine if you're interested in brain lesions, you could do a similar experiment where you lesion a connection and see what happens to your predicted data. So another nice thing you can do with DCM. And finally, I mentioned it's really nice to show that your parameters have predictive validity. 
So here we ask the question, could we predict the age of a new participant given their estimated connection strengths alone? So what we did is we took the two connections that the Bayesian model comparison had shown were really important as showing differences between the two groups. And here we're plotting the connection strength uh, what's this one showing? Yeah, this is showing the predictive accuracy. Um, and what we can do is ask what's, uh, so the way you can interpret this is what's the total amount of explained variance in the right M1 response as a result of that connection. And what you can see is that the total variance explained actually, if you were to put these two connections together, is that it explains about 44% of the variance in uh, region M1s between subject variability. Um, and this is actually a very tough test because it's it's um, out of samples correlation. So it's trying to predict the age of new subjects who haven't been seen before. So overall, that's showing that the parameters are not just different between groups, but they also have some, some meaning. It also tells us we've got a lot of work to do. We've only managed to explain 44% of the variance between people's M right M1 amplitude. There's obviously a lot more that we could still explain, but I think not bad as a starting point. Okay, so there we go. Uh, eight steps to DCM success and your eventual uh, Nobel Prize. Um, if this has piqued your interest, um, we wrote some tutorial papers, which I recommend. That's a good starting point. Um, if tech, if you want to read some more of the technical details, um, they're provided here. Also, the appendices, the appendix in each of these tutorial papers um, goes into quite a bit of technical detail as well. And that, that might be a good starting point. Um, and I'll leave you with a quote um, that we always like to show in our DCM lectures, which is um, the final blackboard that Richard Feynman left. Uh, after he passed away, um, saying that what I cannot create, I do not understand, which uh, just makes the case for trying to do modeling to not only describe the data we observe, but also try to build models that can explain the mechanisms for how that data was generated. Thank you very much.